I was really excited to read this article by Michelle Rolf Truyo and the reader. It's one of my favorites. Truyo was one of my first professors in graduate school. One of the most brilliant anthropologists there is. You think this article was hard. He used to leave his articles to read and they were in French. It was really hard to be prepared for class if the reading was in a different language. But a super brilliant person and anthropologist. And his perhaps his most famous article is this one, Anthropology and the Savage Slot. Oh, I should say that he wrote his, his book, Silencing the Past, Power in the Production of History, is perhaps his most famous in part because it speaks to issues beyond anthropology. And then in Global Transformations, his his last book because he uh, he unfortunately passed away too young he had dealt with some brain aneurysms and so this was his last book published he reworked anthropology in the savage slot which was originally written in 1991 that came out again in 2003 and so i was really excited about it one of the issues is in this selection they take the last few pages of his article, and I probably would have taken the first. So the selection is strange, and I'm going to try and do the first part of it rather than the last. I feel for the people who are trying to cut these cut these selections down to something readable, but I would have done it differently. First of all, given my description, which one of these two anthropologists is Michelle Rolf Truyo, would you guess? Because that's what all the anthropologists look like. And if somebody says, Truyo, Michel Rolf Truyo, and I tell you that he was giving us articles in French and was a brilliant anthropologist, you think he looks like a French guy, right? But in fact, yes, Michel Rolf Truyo is a Haitian anthropologist that since France was the colonizer of Saint-Domingue, which later, of course, had, had the Haitian Revolution. Many of the people speak French and Haitian Creole. And especially if you were in the elite, you were sometimes educated in France or could be educated in, in French and got names like Truyot. The guy on the right is a, somebody we've read for as Claude levi Strauss. So the first question is, what does Truyo mean by the savage slot? The savage slot is what makes us believe that one of these people is brilliant and the other person can't be an anthropologist, right? That there is a world that is divided into an us, a civilized world, and a savage world, and that people in that category can only be, can only do certain things. And so both of these people were, were French speakers. And what in this selection, one of the important parts I thought is what Trio said anthropology could do at the very least, at the very least, you can show that the other person here and elsewhere is indeed a product, symbolic and material of the same process that created the West. So we've been talking a little bit about that in this class, how in some ways the people that we see as primitives, other savages, were in fact co-created by a process of colonialism. And that's how, in fact, the, the original article, one of the first things that Truyo notes in Anthropology in the Savage Slot is how the interconnected, again, like we learned from Eric Wolf, how interconnected the European area was with Islam and the, the world of the what we now think of as the East or the Middle East. And what he says here at the very beginning is that if you were living in what is now Spain in 1492, from the point of view of contemporaries, the most important event of the year 1492. Actually, for us, what was the most important event of the year 1492? Yes, Columbus. Columbus. Right. But if you were living in Spain, what would have been the, or what was then called 
Castile and Aragon, what would have been the most important thing that happened to you in 1492? Now look at Islam getting up there and, and basically ruling most of what the Iberian Peninsula, what is now Spain and Portugal, for all that time. In 1492, what would have been the most important event? The conquest of the Muslim kingdom of Granada and its incorporation into Castile. So basically, the people who would start calling themselves Spanish and Portuguese had pushed the Muslims back and they finally conquered Granada. And that set up what would be called, what would flow into the conquest of the Americas, setting up some of the largest empires of the world and colonizing the Americas. And what Trio is saying is that this colonization during this time, the stuff that happened about 500 years ago, the conquest of America stands as Europe's model for the constitution of the other. So I put this map up because for one thing, and this actually is important to us for something, I, well, it's important to us forever, is you'll notice that most of North America, most of what we call the United States was actually under or, or was claimed by Spain all the way up to all the way up to Alaska there. The Anglo presence in, in the United States was late and small as compared to what the Spanish and Portuguese were doing. So the savage slot, especially in these early years from say 1400 to 1600, is important to us because what Trio is arguing is that anthropology inherited this whole idea about the other and what people were like. And that this whole time, especially under the, the what the Spanish and the Portuguese did, was a time when people were organized by colonialism long before there was any anthropologists. And so what is important here is that the whole idea that there was a Christian place in Western Europe emerges during this period. Before that, in 1492, the other thing that happened in the Iberian Peninsula is they expelled the Muslims and they also expelled the Jews. You had to convert or, or, or be expelled from Spain. And so people were living not necessarily harmoniously all the time, but in relative peace. Muslims, Jews, and Christians on, in Western Europe, and that became quite different at the time. So what Trio is arguing is that during this time, you have this construction of the West along with an other, which is the alter ego, the savage, or the primitive. So in the process of constructing itself as a Christian civilized Western world, there's always this other that you are constructing yourself or against. Now, there's several different versions of what we might call the savage slot, or I think there are. And we've seen some of these before. One of them is that we do have this common human nature, but there are some people who are savages and then they can become barbaric and then they can become civilized, which is to say that they are what we were like before and we improved and they could become like us too. You just have to educate people and change them. Let me remember who might, what we've read, who might tell us that people were once savages and then barbarians and then civilized. This ring a bell. This was the, uh, this is the, the Lewis Henry Morgan version of the of the world, right? Linear evolution that people can be on this ascending path, and it's not necessarily, as they said, it's it, it it's pretty racist, but it's not necessarily. It could just be a culturalist explanation. So that's one version. Another version is is that people are just so different that they can't become anything else the idea that they aren't like us and we really can't make them like us even if we tried 
Everybody's in their own little box over there, locked in that category. Who would we say most represents this? Maybe, maybe we read this in the last class. What the point of view is this, that people can't change. They've pretty much always been that way. And you have to make sure that you keep them in line. Well, it's, yeah, he's probably, it's probably describing what Said would call Orientalism. This is Balfour's point of view, right? It's our duty to to govern these people because they're incapable of self-governance. It's not that you can, you can't make them any different, right? You have to keep governing them because they're going to be that one. So we've read people that have this point of view that would lock people into these categories. A third version, which I don't know if we've really read, but some anthropologists get really into this idea, not many, would be called, it's more like the version of the noble savage. And in this version, it's all inverted. You still have savages out there, but they're like the wise people. They're the ones you go to to find harmony with nature and wisdom in the world. And we, the civilized, are actually the dumb ones here. The barbaric, terrible ones. Actually, does this, does this, we, I don't think we've read anybody like this, but who's a, what people might be into this point of view these days? The hippies. I think, so. I think this is actually coming back and I don't want to make fun of the hippies or the environmentalists because we need them. But the idea, like we're going to go off, they are going to teach us something, which again, I want to make fun because that's important. And it's probably, it's probably a better, it's a better idea than the, Savage, savage. So where does anthropology come in to this? Again, all of this happened before there was an anthropology, these ideas about who they were. And so what Trio says is that anthropology did not create the idea of the savage, rather the savage, this idea. And again, he's using this as an idea framework. He's not talking about actual people. He's talking about a, dis a framework that we have was the raison d'etre, there's that French word coming in, the basis for, the main reason that anthropology existed. So what happens is, is that anthropology inherits this whole symbolic order, and then anthropology becomes the ones that's like, okay, you go study those people. And so he says in this selection that it's not, the, the power of anthropology doesn't come from what the anthropologists necessarily actually do. So it would be great if we could just rely on these genial immigrants, these nice immigrants like Franz Boas and Malinowski. It would be great if that's what defined anthropology, but in fact, it is defined by this wider order into which it fits. And that was what was important to study. Now, this is the savage slot and our ideas about that as of, say, maybe as this goes on and, you know, as anthropology comes out, so let's say 100 years ago. By the time that when Trio is writing this, the conceptual field or the conceptual framework of what people thought about others was beginning to shift. Let me give you something. I want you to interpret it. Take one and Think about this cartoon, which was a very famous, has anybody seen this cartoon before? This is a very famous cartoon. It was actually, it came out in 1984. So I want you to take a minute and write down what you think. I do want to, though, specify here that that VCR looks very old to us. But in 1984, the VCR was actually still a status symbol, even for American households, right? So the VCR would have cost you between $200 and $400, which was real money back then. It had come down in price from like $1,500, but it was pretty big deal to have a VCR in 1984. And in fact, I forgot about this, but Blockbuster, the heaven, the place where everybody was excited to go and get movies from, the first store didn't open until 1985. So with that in mind, what is this person? What is, what is, what is going on here? So anyway, take a minute. 
write down your interpretation of this cartoon. What made it so famous? Why is this so interesting? It does relate to something we've talked about, for example, in the in the Kenyatta article that the the indigenous people or the natives are, are very much want something else and are part of the modern world. Why do they think they need to hide the stuff from the anthropologists though? What does that say about what the anthropologists are looking for? The idea is the anthropologists, that they're only going to, the anthropologists are looking for a this timeless past, right? They're not looking for people who have electricity or especially VCRs and televisions. They want the real deal, which is not any of that poking fun at both at the anthropologist but but that everybody in here is in some way play acting too that they're giving the anthropologist what they want i think beatrice medicine for example said that that indigenous people saw anthropologies as like native joke books like that's the people you you told told jokes to because it was not something they wanted to you talked about the cokes and cartridges i have no idea what Trio was saying by the cartridges, but maybe he meant v VCR cartridges. And now that I'm thinking about it, and what he's saying there, right, is that this is what he calls part of the postmodern quandary, right? That in some ways, people there isn't. It's difficult. People are already are already part of the modern world, and this idea that anthropologists are getting something real, you can't cover up the fact anymore that they have Coke bottles, that they're drinking Coca Cola. Right, and that that's everywhere now. So again, this is 1984, and people are starting to shift on their ideas of both what anthropologists do and what indigenous or people are doing. The, this article actually came out in a in a book titled "Recapturing Anthropology in 1991," and this book contains both the Abu Lugod essay, Writing Against Culture, together with Trio's Anthropology and the Savage Slot, as well as a number of other essays, which I described in a couple of classes ago as Anthropology 3.0. What they, what both Abu Lugoda and Trio were responding to was that writing culture approach, which tended to prioritize text and postmodern interpretation and rereading old anthropology. And what Trio claimed at the, well, where I would have ended the article of the Savage Slot is that the direction of the discipline, that is anthropology, now depends upon an explicit attack on the Savage Slot itself and the symbolic order upon which it is premised. So what Trio was saying is, is that, yeah, times have changed. And if we're going to be relevant in the world, what we need to do is attack the whole schema, the whole symbolic order upon which we have these ideas about people being locked into these savage categories. And so that was in 1991 where he said, that's what we needed to do, attack the savage slot itself and the symbolic order upon which it is premised. How do you think that went? What happened? There's still a savage slot with us today. We just call it something different. Yeah. What happened was, at least from my take on this, is that after what happened in 2001, tiny bit before most of you were born, after September 11, 2001, the savage slot came back like huge, mostly in the form of the bad evil savage. There were some noble savage people, but for the most part, all the things that anthropologists had been trying to argue against in terms of stereotypes about others came racing back into the fore. I talked to you about Abu Lugod's book, Do Muslim Women Need Saving?, which was an attempt to address the fact that all of these stereotypes about Islam and and its its evilness, had come back into the fore. I actually once assigned this book to a class and I thought it was pretty good, but one of the problems was is she got so into these depictions of Islam from the West that 
the way at least many people read it in my class was that, oh, yeah, those guys are really bad. Because he had like these big block quotes from from depictions of ideas about Islam. And people were like, whoa, yeah, that's terrible. We better save those Muslim women now. Get over there. Do something. So it was the opposite. Now, I will say that there was a brief interlude or an eight-year interlude when Americans elected Barack Hussein Obama, which at the time was strange because the idea that we could... In America, we'd be able to elect a president who had the same name as Saddam Hussein, or one of his names was the same as this person that was in the Middle East. So it seemed to indicate that maybe we were getting beyond the idea of the savage slot, and maybe we could be different than we were. Now, after that, though, now we have 2016, and the backlash, you might say, is manifested in the election of somebody with a different name. And this just keeps on rolling. So I was just looking at what was going on in Florida. And they just hired this professor who's like, colonialism, colonialism was good. In praise of colonialism. You can go there and uh, take some classes. Anyway, the point of the matter is we're still fighting this stuff out. Some of us would like to return to Truyo. There was a Truyo remixed reader that was put out a couple years ago, and I almost assigned it to this class. But I have to admit that for me, it is actually very difficult, even for me, to read this. It's just hard to read. I can't understand it. It's almost unreadable. So I have to make, I think it needs to be updated. Uh, one of the editors for this says by Jonathan Rosa and Yarimar Bonilla, but they said after Trump's election that the problem with anthropology was that it failed to reinvent itself and find a new purpose beyond the savage slot. And it also failed to find relevance in public debates. So, as I've told you, in the olden days, people like Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, Franz Boas, they were very prominent in public debates. In today's world, hard to find, hard to find an anthropologist out there. And what Rosa and Bonilla argue here is, in part, it's because of the comeback of the savage slot, but in part because anthropology was unable to do what Trujillo wanted it to do, which is attack the savage slot in the symbolic order under which it is premised. I will say that this is not just Trump. We saw in the State of the Union speech, unfortunately Biden did apologize and say he was wrong to blurt this out. But the idea that somebody could be, that the word illegal has become a noun to describe people that you know, officially should be called undocumented immigrants. By the way, Move into our next article now. What would Epoly Health say about this? About being able to immigrate, about being able to migrate, about being able to move from place to place. What would he say? It's very clear. Who are these people? What are the people in the Pacific Islands? What do they do all the time? What was so cool about them? And what's what are they able to do before there were these? To be able to move. Move around. Don't worry about nations and borders and all these things. Fact at the end, Halfa says that human nature demands space for free movement. The more, the bigger, the better. That's an essential part. The anthropology should teach this that my being able to migrate, being able to move, is essential to being human. It's one of our best adaptive qualities. This idea that we're supposed to wall people off and hold them in place and keep them from moving around. No. Anyway, I do want to I do want to say that on the bright side of this, there are Democrats in Texas and they cringed at this. In the old days they wouldn't have cringed. Democrats, Republicans, they've been like, yeah, we don't care. But in fact they did cringe and they said this is not right. You shouldn't they, the same People from some people from Texas, at least, were were cringing at this depiction, and so 
I don't want to, what I want to tell us here is that although some very bad stuff has happened in the last 20 years or so, we also see that people that were once in this slot, the savage slot, are able to speak and document their own realities more than perhaps they were before, and not necessarily, and probably many of them have become anthropologists. And I think that people like me are more aware now than perhaps before. And of course, I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize the backlash here, but there are many more people who are able to say phrases like white supremacy without the, there's many more, pe more people who know about that and, and are, are interested in that and interested in, are, are, are owning up to that history and that present period. So that brings us to Epoly Alpha and our Sea of Islands. So first of all, if you think about what would be the savage slot depiction of the Pacific Islands, it's you have this big ocean and then there's just a bunch of islands, little islands out there. That idea that they're just these little islands creates a sense of hopelessness. All right. And he says he, he himself did it. He used to be in front of students and say that, and they'd, he'd be like, yep, we can't do it. We're going to be, we're, go, we're not going to make it small and defeated. And then he's like, wait a second. In propagating a view of hopelessness, I was actively participating in our own belittlement. What does it do to rethink this as our sea of islands? whole geographical notion and our whole idea and really it's against the slot that people get into what's crucial to the alpha is of people who were able to move around from place to place and were they didn't see this the idea is our idea of being on an island is you're somehow stuck there right you're on this little island and you can't you're there you are on this small island not connected to each other but he has all these great, great phrases, the trading and cultural exchange systems, that they were multilingual. The sea was open to anyone who could navigate a way through, right? And so it was the, the, if you grew up in this ocean world, then you could, you saw that as like all being connected to each other. We all know that only those who make the ocean their home and love it can really claim it as their own. Conquerors come, conquerors go. The ocean remains mother only to her children. This mother has a big heart, though. She adopts anyone who loves her. And so he's saying that these islands were interconnected before, they, before the Europeans imposed all these nation states and boundaries. And he also says that they're being increasingly interconnected today and that, in fact, people are flowing along around along these ancient routes. And again, human nature demands space for free movement. And the larger the space, the better it is for people. This hopelessness that when we think of the Pacific Islands these days, we do think that they're all about to get submerged by the ocean by climate change. But I mean, this is a it's a huge issue. But the people there are also are also adapting and changing and have. And, and are interacting with the modern world. He mentions here that it is like the Caribbean. And ever, as I was reading this article, I kept thinking about a song that I wanted to play for you, but it's in Spanish, so I won't make you listen to it. But it's, it's a song by someone who was raised in Cuba and basically says, I love this island. I'm from the Caribbean. I can't be on tierra firme on like solid land because it inhibits me keeps me in place and that basically his idea was and it has this wonderful tune to it that being in the caribbean and being on an island was like an opening it was like freedom now, like i said i can't understand this i grew up in the mountains for me being on land and being in the mountains is where you can be free. And if I'm on the, an island in the ocean, I feel trapped. 
But for him, it's the opposite. He feels trapped in the mountains, too much land, too much can't get around. But if you're in the ocean, if you're in if you're in a place where you can be on the sea, then as he says here, the sea was open to anyone who could navigate a way through. So again, it's a or it's a it's a change in our perspective, a whole attack on this notion of people locked in this slot of hopelessness or locked into a slot of primitiveness or locked into a slot of being unable to 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 navigate quite literally their own futures 